you're a designer or engineer, chances are you've sent something out to be printed by a 3D printing service bureau. And if you've done that, you've probably had an experience where a quote comes back surprisingly high or surprisingly low. Today, we're gonna demystify that a little bit and talk about some of the factors that go into how 3D printing jobs are priced and some of the ways that you can avoid surprises by considering these factors as you go through the design process. I'm joined today by Max Newberger, who's a senior design and development engineer at Fast Radius. Fast Radius is a member of the Carbon Production Network, and it offers a wide variety of fabrication capabilities. Welcome, Max. Good to have you here. Thanks, John. Really appreciate it. So let's begin by taking a look at some of the major cost drivers in 3D printing. Max, can you give us an, an overview of what goes into the construction of a quote from a service like Fast Radius? Sure. Yeah, we will look at the quantity and, and volume of your parts, as well as how efficiently we can nest them and organize them in the build plate. And we're also going to look at the print time and how much post-processing is going to be required on the back end to make sure that we deliver a, a high quality functioning part. Great. Yeah, let's talk about quantity and volume. What, what are the factors there? Sure. So the, the print cost is going to be distributed over however many parts are on the build tray. So if we can fit a few more parts on the build tray, that uh, cost is going to be distributed across more pieces. And so if we're going to have to go through many several prints in order to fulfill your order, um, all of that machine time is going to be, have to be distributed. So uh, obviously, um, higher volumes will uh, lead to lower costs. There's economies of scale. And Fast Radius is actually rolling out a feasibility report that will include a cost curve, generally showing how the part uh, price will decrease as the volumes increase. And let's talk about nesting and how that makes a difference. Um, what, what is achieved when a designer, you know, considers the size of the build platform and how the parts fit on it during the design process? Sure. Yeah, we, we see um, a lot of parts where we might be able to easily fit, let's say, five parts on the build tray. And if we could really just add a sixth piece, the price would decrease significantly. Because again, um, going from five to six might not seem like that big of an increase, but being able to shave off maybe one or two whole build um, cycles um, will end up saving the customer a lot of money. And so being able to consider that while designing the part um, can lead to huge cost savings um, when you're considering how many you're going to be able to print at a single time. So say you're ordering 12 of something, if you can get six to fit on the build platform instead of five, that's the difference between doing just two runs on the printer instead of three. Exactly. And, and that third run will only have two parts. So hypothetically, those are even more expensive than the original 10. Right, right. This seems like an area where uh, you can also get some value by thinking about larger format 3D printers, right? So that you can fit more parts on the build platform and also have a better chance at nesting them. For sure. And the, the Carbon L1 machine obviously is a, is a great example of a, a large format machine. And we're lucky enough to have one in, at our factory in Chicago. Um, we, we actually had an example recently where uh, being able to use the large format printer uh, we were able to cut the number of pieces in a required job from uh, 20 pieces down to 10 because those pieces were able to be twice as long. Um, and beyond that, the actual part price decreased um, 58% on the, on the course of the whole order because we had cheaper parts and only, and only had 10 of them versus a more expensive part having to produce 20 of them. So that illustration you're talking about is, uh, is the case study that you published about 3D printing grippers with Carbon's EPU-41 material. These are um, elastomeric grippers with a lattice pattern, right, that, um, that are used in a production line? Yeah, that's right. So the grippers, um, with their lattice design, are able to grip around the top of a, um, a soap bottle. And uh, the, the elastic properties of EPU were perfect for this application. Um, the, the actual uh, piece of the assembly line is uh, 70, almost 70 inches long, so quite long. And with the M2, we had to produce many small samples, but the, the L1 was perfect. Um, we were able to produce fewer samples, um, and that creates fewer breakpoints where uh, there could be an issue maybe where the lattice bumpers don't line up perfectly. Uh, it's a good example of how you kind of like take a little complexity out of the manufacturing process and it becomes a, a better outcome and much cheaper because it's a better outcome. 
Let's talk about the actual printing and post-processing itself, because this is another component of the, of the cost is the amount of time that your parts are spending in the 3D printer. So what are the, what are the considerations there that designers should think about? Yeah, and, and this is one of the pieces where I, I, I think there's, you know, as you're getting trained on the carbon technology, um, you got to learn new design rules, just like I said, you were designing on any technology. And, and one of them that's very important for carbon is the trapped volumes and, and trapped resin inside the part. And the machine is, is quite smart and is able to recognize when there are certain layers that have um, a vacuum forming and the machine will actually slow down. So when we're looking at designing parts, we're going to try to reduce the time on the printer. And that's one of the best ways to do that is to remove any and all trapped volumes or vacuum forming issues in that design. Um, and then post-processing, where does that cost come from? Yeah, so post-processing, we're going to look at a variety of things, primarily um, support material. It's something that people really throughout the history of 3D printing have become familiar with. And on the carbon machine, um, if you have overhangs you know, above a certain critical angle, you're going to need to support that surface to make sure it forms correctly. Um, on the, the Fast Radius website, you can get a feasibility report that will call out surfaces that have um, an overhang and will require support surfaces, uh, support structures. Um, those services, each one of those is going to increase the cost slightly. And so reducing the number of uh, supported surfaces and the general amount of support material needed is a great way to also help reduce the post-processing time and cost of your part. So this is an area where a designer can really have an impact by considering kind of how their part will sit in the build volume of the 3D printer from the beginning. If you think about those overhangs and the need for supports and also what surface might be able to attach well to the uh, build platform of the printer. Um, the nice thing about overhangs with, with uh, Carbon's DLS process is that those angles can be a little bit more accommodating than with some other 3D printing processes. A lot of printers talk about uh, you know, 45 degree angles being sort of advised, uh, but Carbon, you can get closer to horizontal um, it varies depending on what material you're using, um, but you do have more flexibility there than you do with some of the other printing processes. So let's talk about solid volumes. Uh, you've already mentioned that thick cross sections in a part can slow down the 3D printing process. Uh, and of course you use more material to print those, but uh, there are some other ways that thick cross sections and, and large volumes can lead to poor outcomes, right? Yeah, that's right. Um... When we see very thick uh, sections, uh, large uninterrupted uh, blocks of material, uh, thinking about what's actually happening on the printer, we're worried that sometimes um, resin won't be able to refresh and refill underneath the part in between each slice. And so what we'll see is something very similar to a sink mark on an injection molded part where you might see a, you know, a, a cave or a, a little bit of a valley. Um, and, and obviously those uh, not only will be uh, failures, but expensive failures, right? You're using a lot of material to create these thick sections. Um, and so the easiest solution is to, you know, communicate with the customer and find an, an appropriate lattice that might help reduce the, the thickness of that cross section, reduce the thickness of that uninterrupted area, um, which will lead to a cheaper part, but also one that's going to probably perform much better as well. The interesting thing is that there are some problems with printing large volumes on, um, on a lot of different 3D printing processes for the reason you mentioned with resin printing, it can be difficult to refresh the resin uh, you know, across the large piece. With thermal 3D printing processes as well, it's an issue because um, you wind up with, with uh, problems related to sort of heat um, you know, building up in the part, creating residual stress um, and, and leading to warping and that kind of thing. So it's something you should avoid. And fortunately, it's become a lot easier to add lattices to your part uh, recently. Quick plug, Carbon just released the uh, Carbon design engine software to our customers that makes it easy to, to do that. You can ask you know, designers at Fast Radius to put lattices on things for you. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, lattices and, and why they're great. Yeah. Um... And I, and I actually, speaking of the carbon design engine, I, I ran through that Colgate example, which was designed on a, a different software, but just to sort of rerun through it, look at what you guys had to offer. And um, I was very impressed with how quickly it was able to provide a solution. And also generally the size of the file at the end of the day wasn't too, too large. Sometimes lattice parts can come out 
you know, close to half a gigabyte and, and yours uh, wasn't too large and, and, and was able to, you know, we were able to move much faster um, throughout the whole process then. Awesome. Uh, um, yeah. And so I guess for, for lattices, the, the world is, is really just starting to begin to see all the different ways they can be used. You could use them on a, an elastic material like we did with the gripper or the way that Adidas does in, in the, the midsole. Um, but you can also use them in a rigid material, um, one that isn't necessarily going to compress the way that you're maybe you're used to visualizing it, but might help for a, a, a other reasons. We, you know, we've talked about cost. We can talk about um, the ability to print something successfully, but, you know, all of the carbon resins could in one way or another benefit from having a uh, section latticed. We've got as an illustration of that, this uh, drilling jig that we developed. Um, it's the kind of thing you find all over factory floors. Uh, it's, a, it's a common use case for 3D printing. And often it involves a, a pretty big you know, cross section, a big solid volume somewhere in the part. If you just carve out the center of this um, drilling jig and replace it with a lattice, you can save about 50% of the material that you would otherwise use just filling in the middle of this part and you wind up with a part that performs exactly like it did when it was solid. So it's a, it's a cool, pretty straightforward way to reduce cost, reduce material usage, uh, decrease print time, and, and still get what you want. But the really cool thing about lattices with elastomerics is that you can um, blend lattices together and create different responses on different parts of a single solid volume. It's gotta be one of the coolest features of lattices is being able to control where the thickness is increasing and where the thickness is decreasing. A thicker lattice is gonna have a stiffer response than a thinner lattice. Makes sense, you have more material versus less material. Um, but you can actually target where those thick areas are and where those thin areas are to improve the form performance of your part even further. Uh, me, along with some of my other engineers at, at uh, Fast Radius, we designed this neck pillow that used uh, the sill material on the M2 machine. And we had a thicker base on it um, and a very thin sort of very squishy top half. Um, it's great for traveling back when we could all travel. And it is uh, very comfortable and a great example of how uh, variable thickness lattices can be used to help improve the performance of an already great part. That's such a cool example. And there are a bunch of these that are actually, you know, real products on the market now. Adidas, of course, has uh, midsoles that are 3D printed, specialized and physique. Both sell 3D printed latticed bicycle saddles. CCM makes a 3D printed latticed hockey helmet. And you're gonna see a lot more of these applications come out um, soon. So we've talked about some of the cost components in getting things 3D printed. Most of these are completely within the control of a designer. If you think about 3D printing and the process you're gonna use during the, the design process itself. Uh, so to, just to review really quickly, these are overall volumes. You're gonna get better pricing if you go for higher volumes. There's whether your part fits efficiently in the build platform of the printer. There's the actual geometry of the part um, which uh, can, can slow down the printer or can make it more complicated to post-process the print. And a lot of these can be addressed during the design process, as I mentioned, just by kind of keeping in mind uh, the geometry of your part, how it fits in the printer, or by using new design tools like Design Engine to replace some of your solid volumes with, with uh, lattices that can be really efficient in achieving what you want and cut down on material usage and print time and, and so on. So Max, it's been great to talk with you about all of this. If viewers want to get started with Fast Radius, what's the best way? So uh, come to, go to our website, fastradius.com. From there, they'll be able to upload a part and receive a quote um, for that part. And, and soon to be released is the ability for them to download a feasibility report, which would have um, some of those features that I spoke about uh, which would include the cost curve showing you know, how that price is going to decrease over volumes. It'll also alert them as to some of the design features that could be leading to a higher price than they're used to. Um, and that's a great way for a designer to feel empowered to make the decisions um, to change their part for the better. Great, and viewers, if you wanna learn more about 3D printing, subscribe to Ask an Additive Expert on YouTube. And do visit carbon3d.com if you want to learn more about design considerations for DLS specifically. We have a number of design guidelines right on the website. Max Newberger, thanks so much for joining. 
Thanks, John. Have a good one. Yeah.